Molly McHugh has joined us on the program before. She is back today. She is a foreign policy and strategy consultant, also an information warfare expert. She had a really interesting article, uh, article in Politico, actually, about the release the memo hashtag, which we've been talking about quite a bit. And Molly, what, what you reported is that there actually was significant bot activity behind that memo. And from the beginning, it appeared to me to be a very concerted uh, sort of distraction technique, actually, from the substance of the of the FBI investigation by, by Robert Mueller. Talk to us about how you first started following this. Um, well, you know, obviously, we started paying attention to it, our team here at uh, uh, New Media Frontier, our new company. Um, we started paying attention to this because it was being amplified so quickly and it went from being nowhere to being everywhere at the same time and how that happens is always a really interesting process. I think there were some initial reports, people saying it's Russian bots pushing this hashtag or it's something else pushing this hashtag and, and what that actually is and how it happens is much more interesting um, a process to dig into, which is why we started looking at it. And I think we lay out in the Politico piece um, pretty clearly um, that it's actually a blend of a variety of different elements that came together to make this campaign work effectively. Uh, there were Russian bots, there were other bots, um, there were sort of far right um, information networks in the U.S. engaged in these campaigns. Uh, some of the accounts are automated, some of the accounts are people, some of the accounts are semi-automated. So it's sort of a layering on of um, techniques and, and tactics um, to take a topic, sort of organize a bunch of, um, a, a bunch of things behind a, the same campaign, um, and then target it at lawmakers and others who are going to be making decisions on this topic. And so it's sort of those three factors, the amplification, the targeting, and the organization um, that were really effective in how this worked, um, how, the, how these elements came together and worked very effectively in achieving the outcome they desired. Can you talk a little bit about the targeting piece? Sure. So um, a lot of the initial tweets uh, that started uh, from sort of a very low level network on Twitter um, were tagging Republican congressmen either from the House Intelligence Committee or some of the more uh, sort of pro-Trump uh, White House defender voices on the Hill. So people like Matt Goetz, Lee Zeldin. Um, some were tagging Paul Ryan as well. Um, so people who were who were involved in lobbying their uh, Republican colleagues um, and, and themselves having to vote within the Intelligence Committee on releasing the memo um, were being heavily targeted by these messages on social media. Um, uh, so sort of hundreds of thousands of times over a week, the week and a half, this was an active campaign before the committee voted. Um, and that is essentially an effective form of influence and lobbying in terms of getting a message in front of an elected official and then getting them to act on that information. When we first mentioned that there was a lot of bot activity around this hashtag, I would get sort of anecdotal emails from people saying, uh, David, I used the hashtag and I was not part of either a, a Russian coordinated effort nor people lobbying members of Congress or whatever else. Can you talk a little bit about how uh, maybe the term useful idiot applies here? And again, that's not an ad hominem. That's actually a term that has a very, very specific meaning where these campaigns don't actually require the sort of conspiratorial knowledge of all participants to be effective. No, that's that's exactly right. And I think that that's where these echo chambers are really effective. Um, there is uh, behind and underneath a lot of what we see online, there is a lot more organization and purposefulness than I think we often admit. Um, there are uh, on the far right and the far left, but more so on the far right, it's been documented and discussed a lot, these sort of rooms and chat groups and, and sort of other organizational tools that are being used by far right and alt right interests in the United States to coordinate their messaging campaigns and build them online. Um, that does exist, but that's not to say everything is behind uh, a puppet master. You know, once people are have established networks on Twitter, um, they promote things from people they know and trust, um, same on Facebook, same on other social media. Um, so once you build these structures, it's far easier to introduce information to them and, and get them to move in the places that you want them to. Um, and I think sometimes people just aren't aware of how they are engaged in this. However, there, there are a lot of people that are aware of what they're doing. Um, and the combination of those things, uh, of, of 
real people's accounts who are basically semi-automated, acting like human bots themselves. Um, so their accounts automatically follow and retweet and promote content from, from specific accounts, um, from specific narratives. So you have accounts of, of real people who were tweeting, release the memo a hundred times in a day. Um, that is not normal behavior for anyone's social media account. So they're sort of knowingly and, and purposefully acting and saying, we need to promote this to make this trend. Um, and that is an interesting element of the, the different pieces that we were looking at, because there's sort of the human uh, automation slash amplification side and the straight uh, sort of bot, uh, actual automated, uh, you know, scripted by algorithms side. And the combination of those two is very effective. And the goal of both of them is essentially to, to build these trends, to target people that will see them, and to get that information into and promoted from verified accounts. Because once you hit um, a sort of a, get a verified account uh, to, to promote these on Twitter, uh, the, the amplification occurs much more quickly. Can you talk a little bit about the, the sort of function of analytical software to look through the usage and the sort of pattern of usage of the hashtag, because people might hear you and I talking now and they'll say, okay, uh, it must, you know, Molly McHugh scrolling through a Twitter feed manually is not going to give us anything beyond sort of anecdotal information, but we're talking about the use of, of actual analytical software to examine this, this hashtag, are we not? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we have a combination of uh, software that we're building ourselves, plus some of the commercially available tools. Um, and some of it is sort of free online things to do this, but it's, uh, we looked at this in a variety of ways. Some of it was scrolling through specific accounts uh, in painful detail, trying to figure out who they were, what they were, uh, where they came from, et cetera. Um, but you also have to look at the volume over time, uh, the, the number of accounts engaged in these campaigns, um, how they acted together, sort of where the information comes from, where it gets injected to, how it gets promoted ultimately over time. Um, and that is, uh, there's a variety of ways to do that uh, software that visualizes things in different ways that can pull data from different places. But in particular, for this campaign, um, it was useful for us to have access to some of the stored Twitter data um, because a lot of the camp or a lot of the accounts that were engaged in this um, campaign have either been deleted or suspended or have deleted their own content on uh, the release the memo hashtag since the memo was released, which is also interesting. Um, so it, you kind of need these different elements coming together to look at this. Um, and I think that one of the best examples of this was there was, a, a, I think, a blogger or something, but who had published his own analysis of the origins of Release the Memo. But he got it wrong because he didn't have access to the information from the accounts that have been um, released or blocked. Um, and, and that was important to have to be able to look at the beginning of the campaign. In sort of layman's terms, I think that this succeeded in the sense that it did significantly pull attention away from the sort of subject matter uh, of Robert Mueller's investigation, but also from other stories that were not particularly positive stories for Donald Trump. And for several days, it really got a lot of attention. But that's just sort of me taking like a generalist perspective. How would you assess the success of this campaign? In a variety of different ways, uh, it was extremely successful. And I think in the base, uh, the most basic level, uh, the goal of establishing these types of information networks through social media or through other means is uh, building and using activation potential. And in this case, it worked very effectively. You had an extremely engaged community um, pushing this narrative, pushing this idea. It doesn't ultimately matter what the memo was or what was in it. I don't think it changed anybody's mind about it one way or the other. Um, but it was the the organizing power of the idea of release the memo has now created a very comprehensive uh, and detailed conspiracy architecture into which a lot of the narratives currently being pushed from the same lanes make a lot of sense. You know, the FBI is bad. U.S. intelligence is bad. The U.S. is surveilling its own people. This is bad. Um, all of this kind of fits into the talking points that you hear coming, uh, unfortunately, from the Oval Office and from other right media in the U.S., but um, this one hashtag became kind of the organizing principle in people's heads for, for how this made sense, so it was extremely effective in a variety of ways. How else might we measure it? In other words, are there any um, numerical comparisons that can be made, or what, what else do you look at when you're sort of looking at the spread of the hashtag? 
Well, there were a couple of things that we were using to look at uh, how widespread or effective this was. One was on the targeting piece for Congress, um, and I think the the volume there spoke uh, it said a lot. There were hundreds of thousands of tweets targeting members on the committee before they voted to release the memo, and if you compare that to sort of a very active period when there would have been constituents, like actual people calling into congressional offices about healthcare, about you know the tax bill, about some vote that's happening that people wanna have their voices heard on. Um, it, this was you know three times that amount of volume per day in some cases in terms of, of how many messages an individual member would have been getting. So the perception for them would have been, this is something that has um, a tremendous amount of support behind it. Um, even if they don't know what the origins of that are, their their Twitter mentions and timelines would have been totally flooded by this concept. And that does make an impression on how people think about these things. The other thing, what we tried to compare the release the memo campaign to um, uh, two other sort of similarly timed events uh, that were actually happening, the 2018 Women's March and um, an NFL playoff game that was that weekend. And if you look at the total volume of tweets that were coming from uh, over a similar period of time, so about eight hours of time, if you look at the total volume of tweets coming from what we know were around a, women, a million women and other participants engaging in these demonstrations, and then a lot of people watching a, a very popular uh, national football event, um, in both cases, those were, you know, a third or less, um, a third or less of the volume um, of tweets as the release the memo hashtag was getting when it was being promoted, and um, I think that's that's really significant that that initial that initial ramp up phase was so quick that it was happening late at night that it was happening primarily without the engagement of some of the big amplifiers that we all know, uh, you know, Hannity, Ingraham, uh, people like that. They were engaged very late in the campaign. This was coming from other places before the big voices got involved. Check out Molly McHugh's article in Politico, how Twitter bots and Trump fans made release the memo go viral. Molly, thanks as always for talking to us. Thanks for having me on.